Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Russell. I'm Head of Research at Hospice UK. I'm delighted to um, welcome you to our afternoon session about using outcomes to make a difference. Um, I'm sure you've already heard this already, but presentations will be on our website in future, so you, if you want to be able to download them in the future, do visit our exhibition and our poster, poster um, displays, as included in the oral poster showcase on Friday. Um, I'm, going, I'm delighted to be able to welcome both of our speakers today. I'm going to introduce both of them, and then our first speaker, Fliss, is going to speak, and then Peter, our second speaker, is going to speak, and then we've got some time for discussion and thoughts. Um, and I think this is really important. As many of you know, Hospice UK has been very proud to support using outcome measures in care, to be able to support hospices to demonstrate the difference that they make. And I think a more depth consideration and conversation is very appropriate now. Um, particularly as we, we work in a climate of different financial constraints and increasing need. So I'd like to introduce you to Professor Fliss Murta. Now, I think Fliss probably doesn't need introduction to many of you, but she um, is a professor of palliative care at Hull and York Medical School and visiting professor of palliative care at the Cecily Saunders Institute um, in London. Many of you will have read her publications in the past. Um, she's done a lot of publication and work on palliative and end-of-life care, um, including that for older people and for advanced kidney disease. And I've had the pleasure for the last year or two to work with, um, with Fliss on the outcome, outcome measures of oak outcome measures suite of measures, um, which is a project funded by the guys and St Thomas's charity. Um, she's also been involved in a lot of other research projects, and she's leading the way up in Hull and York. Um, our other speaker today is uh, Dr. Peter May, and I'm also very delighted to meet Peter. I've only ever met Peter, I think, on Twitter and on conference calls, so it's glad to see, I'm glad to see you in the flesh, Peter. Um, he also is a re um, research scientist focusing on the economics of care for people with serious and life-limiting illness. And I think what's really interesting about Peter is about the fact that he designs and uh, runs an uh, analysis and analyzes evaluations of interventions for patients and their families. And I think that one of the things that we're really missing these days is thinking about the economic outcomes for care as well as many of the other things that we do. So I'd like to invite Fliss to start off. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the invitation to speak, and it's great to see so many uh, friends, but also meet some new folk. So I'm going to talk over the next 20 minutes about using outcomes to make a difference. Uh, what we're referring to here is individual level point of care outcomes. Uh, so I know in Irene's talk this morning, we heard quite a lot, for example, about safety but we're not talking here about safety indicators and we're not talking here about measures of experience, both of which are equally important, but it's not the subject of today's talk. What we are talking about is measures that capture change in health status for patients and families. I'm going to focus on three main outcome measures from the Oak suite of measures. I'm happy to take questions about the other measures, but I thought I would, for simplicity's sake, focus on three measures that are the most important. The first is phase of illness. Uh, stable, unstable, deteriorating, dying, and deceased or bereaved, depending on whether you're talking about it from patient or family perspective. I would emphasize that phase of illness is actually not strictly about the patient. It is about the acuteness of the palliative care plan, the urgency with which one needs to address the person's needs. So it's, a, it's an indirect measure of the acuteness of those needs. Um, the evidence for it is primarily in the paper published by Masso in Palliative Medicine in 2014, but we've also published recently uh, this year uh, a paper with the lead author of Harriet Mather looking at it in the UK context. The second measure I'm going to include is the Australian Karnofsky performance status, a measure from 0 to 100% in leaps of 10, which reflects functional status, where 0 is dead and 100% is fully functioning. Uh, that's been reported primar primarily in a paper by Abernathy, 
um, from Australia, but also uh, subsequently in a lot of other papers. Uh, and there's a good uh, validity and reliability of the measure. And the third measure I'm going to talk about is IPOS in two versions of IPOS, either the full version, which is scored from 0 to 68 on the total score, or IPOS 5, which is a shortened version with five items. Um, if you need details of them, they're at the website, www.pos-pal.org. There's plenty of information there. Uh, but there's also publications in relation to this um, in 2006, and more recently, uh, we've published more on the IPOS measure itself, its validity, reliability, and acceptability. So these are encapsulated in the Oak Suite, and some of you will be familiar with version two of the Oak Booklet, which describes the suite of measures. And I just wanted to flag to you that version three will be coming soon, where we have taken the learning from a, a wide range of sites and try to inform the evolution of the suite. So the focus in version three is on the three core measures, phase, AKPS, and IPOS, but using the other measures more as additional add-in measures so that they become not so much core, but you add them in when you need them. Views on care, Bartel, and a, measure, a new measure called gas light, which focuses on the rehabilitation aspects um, of palliative care, particularly on goal setting. Uh, we're also going to have greater clarity about the timing, and I think we recognise there are problems with the carer measures, which we're going to try and resolve, perhaps for version four. So, what outcomes data might we want to understand and interpret once we begin to collect these pieces of information about individual patients within a service? Well, I would recommend that you keep it simple to start with, and we still need that basic information which is descriptive and contextual to understand what the outcome measures might mean. So information that we've already had for some years, the number of people being seen within a specific time period, their age, gender, diagnosis, distribution, and so on. But particularly the other bit of contextual information that I would suggest is added is understanding the average length of an episode of care. And the reason I think that's so important is that the model of care will change the length of the episode of care. So you can imagine some community services, uh, perhaps doing an early intervention, might operate for a short period of time and then remove specialist palliative care services and expect a re-referral later whereas others might keep people on the books for a longer period of time. So your model of care drives how long the episodes of care are. And if you don't understand that to start with, it can be very hard to understand the outcome measures. Secondly, although we are calling these outcome measures, and they are outcome measures... They are used in two distinct ways, and I think there's still not much clarity yet about those two distinct differences in how the measures are used. Firstly, you can use them at first point of assessment, uh, the presentation of patients, to understand case mix, to understand the complexity of how people are presenting. And I'm sure you can see that it's really important to know, of the people coming through your door, how many are in the unstable phase? What level of problem severity do they have as reflected in their IPOS scores? And what sort of functional impairment do they have? And it may be very different for one hospice, perhaps working with a cohort of older people, <coughs> to another hospice maybe working with a different population. So understanding the case mix is really important. Now that's not outcomes but it's really helpful to know. And I would say it's one of the first important things to understand. How best the three measures, phase, AKPS, and IPOS are combined is reflected in the reports from both the currency testing and it will be further reported uh, from the sea change project which I'm leading. So look out for that information during the next year 
because it will help with case mix. So the second way to use the measures is not just at the first point of assessment, but to look at the change in health status over time that they represent. And this is getting really close to what matters for patients and families. They want to see an improvement in their well-being, an improvement in their pain or their breathlessness, an improvement in their function over a period of time. So this is getting close to the outcomes that we really want to use to demonstrate the impact of services. And the question arises, what time period should we measure that change over? And I would put it to you that we need to measure that change over the duration of phase of illness. And the reason for that is that if you measure it over the whole episode of care, you can see from what I've said earlier that your length of episode of care may be very variable according to the model of delivery. And so it reflects more the model of care that you're delivering rather than meaningful change for the patients. If you use phase of illness, then you begin to standardise that approach across a whole range of services regardless of their model of care. And you will see when I refer to duration of phase that that too becomes a really important outcome. So the time period over which you measure these things is critically important and it needs to be driven by phase of illness for both clinical reasons, practical reasons and to ensure that we're standardising across services. The second question to arise is whether one looks uh, at the whole group of people and how their outcomes change or by some proportion or sector or group within that, within that number. And I think the most useful ways to look at this are the whole group or the groups broken down by phase of illness. For example, if someone is in the unstable phase, it's really helpful to understand what all of the people in the unstable phase are doing over the duration of that phase. So, what should we measure? We're trying to get to those outcomes that are so important, and these are the things that are emerging from your services as the most useful things to capture. First of all, time in the unstable phase. So the unstable phase of illness is that time when your needs as a palliative patient are most acute and urgent, where the plan has to be put in place to address them quickly. You can't really wait. You're probably in a bit of crisis. Uh, you may certainly have acute symptoms and problems that need addressing today. So getting people out of that phase where things are stabilised and they're either more gradually deteriorating or they're stable is really important. If you've only got a few weeks to live and you spend much of that time in an unstable phase, that is time that you can't spend doing the things that matter to you, being with your family, being at home, being wherever you want to be and enjoying the remnants of your life. So getting the unstable phase of illness reduced should be a really important priority for all services. And at least beginning to measure it is a step in that direction. The second uh, thing that we should think about capturing is change in the Australian Karnofsky performance score. Now, we know that in general people are deteriorating, but maintaining their function, even improving their function a little bit, is possible and it should be what we're driving at. Uh, I, I know if you were in the session with Irene this morning, she showed data that Matt Maddox has produced which shows that you can reverse frailty even in sick palliative care patients. That is maintaining or improving their function. So we should be driving to try and do that as much as possible. We should also be looking at the IPOS items and their change over time. So is pain being improved? Is breathlessness being improved? Are information needs being delivered? So somebody getting more information as they wish? 
Is their anxiety being reduced? Is their family being supported? So looking at change in the IPOS items over the duration of phase is really important. If one can't look at all of the IPOS items, then IPOS 5 items. There are some cautions in this that probably it's not helpful to look at total IPOS scores or IPOS subscales until you've got enough data. So if you've only got a small hospice and small numbers, just wait until you've got sufficient data to do that robustly. And we tend to suppress anything where you've got less than 10 people in any one category. Now, that's really small numbers, uh, but it just gives you an idea what we're looking for. So we need to move towards understanding how much our services are improving pain for those with pain, breathlessness, anxiety. Are we ensuring people are more peaceful? Are we addressing their information needs? Uh, one of the ways we can look at that is looking at the proportion of people who start a phase of illness with moderate, severe or overwhelming pain or whatever other problem to look and see how many of those people by the end of the phase have absent or mild pain or whatever. And that's a really useful metric to understand where people are having problems and where they're being addressed. You may also wish to use the Bartel index to show how dependency is often increasing over time because that's the best way to show the, how sick the population is. So, to summarise that, there are two ways to use individual level point of care outcomes data. You can use them at individual level or at cohort level. If you use them at individual level, just understanding where people are when they start and where they end up after a phase of illness, you can really use that well in multidisciplinary team meetings to understand the, the workload and whether it's evenly distributed and allocated, to identify the actual impact for individuals within the service, to uncover resistant symptoms or symptoms that we have a blind spot about and we don't really address. An example would be fatigue, which is very common, and we rarely think about how best to address it to address unmet needs, to plan the way the team is working, and to develop services so that if you see patterns of symptoms that are not commonly addressed, you think about why they're not being addressed. I know when I was working down at King's in the hospital there, we could commonly see that psychological issues, anxiety particularly, was not being addressed. And so we tried to make a business case to bring in more support for psychological interventions. Uh, and that made a big difference. So there are lots of ways in which you can use this data at individual patient level to improve care. And in fact, if you're measuring these things, you are obligated to try and then focus what you do to address the problems you uncover. In the session before, someone recognised that the first uh, three lines of the IPOS measure are an open question asking people what their concerns are. And we know that only 40% of those things are identified by specialist palliative care staff. So just asking that question opens the door and then one needs to work to address the issues. So that's using data at individual level and you can use it both at start and then the outcomes data. But also, what is more useful to those who are leading services is to look at the cohort aggregated data. So all of the people coming through a service within a particular time frame, be it six months or a year maybe, to say what is the overall pattern of problems, of phase, of AKPS in those people, and how is it changing? And that is really good evidence for what you are doing in your service, what everything is driving towards. Again, you need to look at the first point, case mix, and then the change over time, what I call true outcomes data. So I'm going to give you some practical examples of how you do that, because I think that's the way to make it clear. This is the first point 
of within a contact uh, within an episode of care and it's just providing information on the distribution of phase of illness so what's interesting here and what surprised us a little bit is that in the hospice setting which you can see up the top there on the right uh, that actually quite a lot of people are in phases other than unstable. And this may reflect the model of care within the hospice. So if, for example, there's respite care, there may be people coming in stable. Uh, and if they are focused more around an end-of-life care model, there may be more people in the deteriorating and dying phase. You can see how that will vary according to where the hospice is focusing its energies. In the hospital, the highest proportion is, the, is in the unstable phase, and that's perhaps what we might expect. But what strikes me when we look at that is that there is relatively little resource in the hospital teams, and yet they have this very high proportion of very unstable people. In the community, it's a bit more dispersed, but still you see a high proportion of people who are in the unstable phase. But understanding this sort of information for your services actually starts to uncover the genuine workload of what the staff are trying to address. And you often find surprises when you start to look at patterns in your area compared to other areas or patterns and changes over time as you try and shift what your services are doing year by year. Uh, still looking at that first presentation, so it's looking at the case mix rather than the outcomes, you can see that you have a distribution of AKPS in different phases. So as you might expect, stable and unstable phases show a really wide distribution of different levels of function. But deteriorating, it starts to shift so that you've got more people who are really quite functionally impaired. What's perhaps more interesting is looking at this data on the right, which is around what sort of problems are people presenting with to this service. And you can see at a glance what are the biggest problems. Here, weakness. And here, family anxiety and also mobility. And I find it's revealing that we have not spent much effort in the last 10 or 15 years, trying to work out what to do to improve and maintain mobility and reduce weakness. Because we sort of think we can't do much about it. And yet, as this has been focused on more, we clearly see that short-term, brief rehabilitation interventions do make a difference. So could we start to shift those things? There's some things that we, ha we do... Uh, see less commonly but we know very well what to do for them uh, nausea and vomiting for example and pain is a mixed picture we do know some other things to do about pain but traditionally I think in hospices we focused on the more physical aspects of symptoms and less on psychological and family uh, family is one to watch and if you watch it when we come to outcomes it would be interesting so that's looking at first point of presentation. Now we come to the true outcomes data. So looking at what's changing over time, the stuff we really want to get to. First of all, time in unstable phase. And you can see in the unstable phase, it has the longest duration. The median is about seven days in this cohort of nearly 600 patients. It's very interesting, and I'll show you quickly some data from Australia, that you can reduce the unstable phase if you work at it. And some outliers have quite long unstable phases. So how can we get that down so those people are out and able to enjoy what remains of life? This is another outcome slide. It's showing what number of people start with moderate, severe, or overwhelming pain, breathlessness, weakness, etc., and how many of those have improved by the end of the first phase of illness. And this is really showing impact of services. Remember family? 
Family anxiety is A, we don't spend enough time with families, and B, you need a longer period of time over which to work with families to support and address their anxieties and their, their needs. But you can see very quickly where we make a big difference and where we don't make such a big difference. And that is invaluable for a service. You can present the same data in other ways. This is change in total IPOS score. If you're below the line, you've had a big improvement in your IPOS score. So all of these individual people have had some improvement and as a proportion of people have got worse. We would expect that because we're dealing with people with deteriorating illness. But this shows very clearly for people in the unstable phase we are making a big difference as a service. You can also show it in this way, which is easier sometimes for staff to understand. People start the red line, and at the end of phase, they're at the green line. And those are the things that are improved. And you can quickly see weakness and mobility are not easily improved, as we know. But again, it's a good way to present data and really demonstrate the impact of the service. I'm just going to quickly spend the last two minutes uh, on data from Australia. And this is national data where they've got phase <coughs> distribution and they've superimposed the duration of unstable phase. And what's exciting is that working over a period of several years, they've managed to increase the proportion of people now reaching 90% of people who have a duration of un unstable phase less than three days. So we have got a long way to go to get to that level, but at least we're beginning to start to measure how we could uh, change that. Similarly, this is showing the proportion of people with moderate or severe pain at the start who have absent or mild pain at the end of phase, exactly as I showed you on the earlier uh, slide, and they're now aiming for 60% of people to be in that group. Uh, again, we've got a way to go, but we're beginning to measure it. So there is real value in achieving this, and I think you can begin to see some of the key metrics that will help drive changes in service and demonstrate the impact for everybody under the care of your teams. It's uh, useful at the level of individuals, and we have to respond to the recording of the measures and action it. It's useful at the level of the cohort or population within the services, measuring quality and effectiveness, describing the complexity of who we see, moving eventually towards comparisons between services, although we have some way to go for that, and also perhaps targeting specialist palliative care to the right people. Thank you. Acknowledgements, uh, the Cicely Saunders Institute, the Guys and St Thomas's Charity who funded some of this work, and particularly Hospice UK, who are continuing to work with us to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And I'm sure that many of you are, as I am, I'm still mulling over and thinking some of those thinking thoughts and questions I want to ask. So please hold them. Um, I'd like to um, introduce you again to Dr. Peter May, um, because I think after we've both these presentations that this will give us a really good meet to have a conversation about how we use outcomes to make a difference. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So as Sarah says, my name is Peter May. I'm a research fellow in health economics, Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, before I start, I won't be covering exhaustively all palliative care economics in the next 20 minutes, so it's worth flagging that I'm a member of a research group in Trinity that is among the most active in this area. Uh, Bridget Johnson, who's also presenting at this um, conference over the next couple of days and is in the room somewhere, is a member of that group as well, and I'll put our contact details up at the end if you have further questions or um, interested in discussing ideas, collaborations, and so forth. So this is the pre C and title of this session, and I suppose I'm here really to talk about the second part, understanding and interpretation of economic evidence. I'm hoping to uh, get to that through three 
sections. First of all, some introductory material to just plant our feet in uh, the world of economics and uh, discuss just some basic conceptual ideas. Then uh, discuss economic evaluation of palliative care as it has been done to this point and talk about what we know about the economics of palliative care to date and then briefly talk about what that might mean for current and future research and provision of palliative care. So first of all, the introductory topic. Um, economic, I'm assuming a fairly uh, limited background knowledge in the room. So um, from first principles, economic evaluation is interested in two things. First of all, we're interested in assessing an intervention's impact on costs. And those could be lots of different types of costs, as you see on the screen. Formal costs to the healthcare system that's easy to, relatively easy to put a pound or euro sign in front of. Also informal costs, the care, help, inconvenience to unpaid networks in the support of people, which is obviously a particularly big issue in end of life and palliative care. And the second part is measuring treatment effects on outcomes, particularly patient outcomes, outcomes like survival and quality of life. But again, in this area, we'd be particularly concerned about family outcomes, caregiver quality of life, bereavement experiences, and things like that. When you combine uh, the estimated effect on costs and on outcomes, you've got what could be broadly termed a cost consequence analysis. There are lots of different technical versions of that, cost <coughs> effectiveness, cost utility, cost benefits, and so on. Um, I'm not going to bother detailing those differences. They're all based on the same idea, which can be conceptually illustrated um, with this map. So once we have evaluated an intervention's impact on cost and outcomes, it ends up somewhere in this one of these four quadrants. You uh, can map the effects on costs on the y-axis or the vertical axis, and the effects on outcomes on the horizontal x-axis. And you can see that uh, those treatments then end up in the southeast quadrant are what are known as dominant strategies. So they're more effective than the alternative and they're also cheaper. So you really are foolish if you don't immediately pursue that idea. Conversely, the northwest quadrant, uh, the strategy you're looking at is both more costly and less effective and you would be stupid to do it. And really where all of the decisions are made and interesting discussions are had are in the northeast and southwest where you get a bit more but you have to pay a bit more or you save a bit of money but you get less for that money. Why do we do this? It's a question I ask myself every day. Uh, the answer is the eternal fact of scarcity. So scarcity is uh, nothing to do with whatever the uh, available health budget is. It is a fact of life that the demands for all of the resources that we have will always exceed what we're able to do and provide. And so the corollary of that is that we have to make decisions to fund some healthcare interventions and not others. And critically, every decision has what economists call an opportunity cost. That is the cost of the next best option, the cost of the road not taken. So every time we spend, you, for example, uh, we ask a government to spend money on palliative care, they may well wish to do so, but that's money that can no longer be spent on child vaccinations, hip replacements, or even more outside of health in secondary education, police, and so on. If this all seems a little uh, abstract and technical for the humane and people-centered world of palliative care, it is worth emphasizing as well that really uh, all of us, whether we realize it or not, engage in a form of economic evaluation every day because we're all faced with finite budgets, both in terms of financial budgets, but we've, there's only so many hours in the day, both at work and at home. We have to make decisions to do some things and not others, to buy some things and not others. One recent example I was thinking about was that I was um, considering subscribing to Sky because my wife and I have a young baby. I'm up all night anyway, so I might as well watch the ashes. <laughs> um, but, and so I looked into it, performed an economic evaluation. <laughs> the, um, the subscription was £78 a month, which is not nothing, but uh, I usually have that in my banking at the end of every month, so it seemed plausible. And then I started to extrapolate the numbers, and that's £936 a year, or over the course of this baby's lifetime is £16,848 going to Rupert Murdoch. 
Now, <coughs> it may well be rational for me to uh, choose to spend my money on a Sky subscription if I want to, because, um, you know, I do like cricket. But the critical point is that that decision would have an opportunity cost, that that money, if I spend it on that, is something that I could spend on lots of other things, either uh, related to, to my family or something else. And so um, you have to, we always have to be mindful when thinking about economic evaluation of healthcare services that where services are not funded, it's not because people necessarily don't think that they're beneficial, but that there is always this competition for a finite, finite resource. So when I presented the results of the evaluation to my wife, you can see that the Sky uh, subscription ends up in the northeast quadrant, so you'd be getting something for our money, but it, it would cost us more. And it's very easy to think of other examples in everyday life that would fill these other, other quadrants. For example, move from a mainstream supermarket to a budget supermarket will save money on grocery bills, but the quality and provenance of the food will be less. Quitting smoking will unambiguously reduce your costs and improve your outcomes, and you should, um, and is therefore a no-brainer. And if you take an African elephant as a domestic pet, then your costs will increase, particularly around circus peanut expenditure, and the, uh, quite your quality of life will go down. And so you would be very foolish to pursue that strategy. <laughs> so, what I've tried to emphasise in this opening section is that the principle of economic evaluation is that we want to know what are the impacts of our available options on both costs and on outcomes. And we do this not out of some kind of uh, utopian managerialist ideal or because um, uh, there are simple, easy answers or that economics should be the only factor in making these decisions, but that Really, economists are people too, and like everybody else, we are interested in ensuring the best care for the greatest number of people. And one element of that decision-making process has to be the optimal allocation of resources, which will always be limited, and as Sarah alluded to, perhaps will be increasingly so over the rest of our lifetimes due to demographic aging, fiscal pressures, and so on. I've also tried to emphasize that while this is abstract and in practice is very complex, um, in fact, it's not, it shouldn't be completely alien even to non-economists, that the principles and the practice of this are really the uh, intuition of everyday life. And the, the final point that I want to emphasize is that perspective really is important in terms of time frame. It's the difference between thinking something costs 78 pounds and 16,000 pounds. So if, when we do something like uh, evaluating the impact of an intervention on health-related quality of life. You might do one or two measures at three months and at six months, for example. But because money adds up in the way that the Sky subscription example shows, it's really only all of the costs over the relevant time frame of analysis are really the only thing that is worth anything. The other thing about perspective, which I haven't had time to work into this presentation is who is paying these costs and the classic example to when teaching to undergraduates here is the idea of a, a bar at a wedding that if everybody has to pay for their own drinks at a wedding then consumption is at a certain level and if the bar is free consumption is at a different level and the difference between those that that the cost difference between those two is passed on to uh, people passed on to a third party, whoever it is, the uh, uh, bride and groom who are uh, footing the bill, but they don't actually get any of, the, any of those benefits. And it's always important when we're thinking about healthcare where there are so many potential different payers to bear in mind, well, whose, whose costs are we actually talking about? So where these ideas, this, this application of uh, economic evaluation has been applied in palliative care, what have we learned? There are three systematic reviews that probably cover more or less all of the relevant evidence. Um, they're all 2014, so probably finished 2012, so all probably due for a, an update, but this is roughly still... Um, uh, you know, highly representative, I would say. So the first is Samantha Smith and colleagues uh, from Trinity College Dublin, 
and uh, their, theirs was in palliative medicine in 2014, is the best known of these, and that looks at palliative care in all settings. So any economic study of any, anything calling itself palliative or end-of-life care, um, they found 46 papers and a consistent cost pattern of cost saving, but you can't really say, uh, put, put numbers on anything because there are so many different interventions and populations under the palliative care umbrella. Then there's a review I did with colleagues in America of the US model of um, hospital inpatient consultation, and that has a much more homogenous evidence base because the intervention is essentially the same, the population are much more similar, and that has, finds a very large cost-saving magnitude of around 20%. And the third is Langton um, and colleagues, which is an Australian team, and they looked at what's called countback or uh, retrospective decedent studies, so looking at a finite period at the end of life, X weeks or months before death, and comparing uh, those who received palliative care with those who did not write at the end of death, they found a very large number of papers and increasing use of that design, so I dare say if it was rerun there would be perhaps 200 of those now. If you take those together, there are two essential take-home messages. The first is that palliative care always seems to be associated with lower costs, but the second is that there are really big knowledge gaps um, on almost all, all major feel, fields of interest. And particular concerns would be the limited scope of inquiry, so I talked a little bit about the importance of time frame in the introductory section. As people are living longer with multimorbidity, uh, living and dying with serious illness, as we like to say now, looking only at short periods before the end of life, not really representative necessarily of the, uh, the treatment of seriously ill people um, and the entire trajectory of care for which palliative care would like to be involved. Short hospital inpatient admissions, of which there's a lot relative to other types of, of interventions. For example, I don't think there's any of inpatient hospice. Well, that's not, uh, inpatient hospital care is not really representative of treating um, serious illness over the disease trajectory either. And equally critical limitation is the perspective. So we tend to be relying on where data are routinely collected. So there's a lot of hospital studies because hospitals routinely collect costs. So it's relatively easy to do those analyses. Um, informal care, that is those costs uh, uh, and hours put in by family members and the out-of-pocket costs they pay uh, there's very few studies of because the only way to get that data is to recruit a large number of informal carers and get information over a long period of time about their spending and, and care habits. Similarly, if you look at something, uh, another big policy question would be institutional uh, to community or home care switches. That's a very difficult analysis to do unless you get a lot of data because the routinely collected stuff is just the housing uh, things, but there's a lot of other relevant costs involved. So it would perhaps be more accurate to say that palliative care is associated with lower costs for the costs that we routinely collect. When it comes to outcomes, the, um, the x-axis part of the figure, there's really very little in the economic literature. Instead, what people tend to say is, well, there's a fair amount of evidence out there, some of which um, have Fliss was talking about and alluding to that palliative care is associated with improved outcomes in this domain and that domain, and therefore, if there are cost savings, then they must be a good thing. Effectively, we're in the southeast quadrant. We're more effective and less costly than the alternative, and it's a no-brainer. Where outcomes have been measured, there's, it becomes very, very complex. Uh, Bridget's PhD work looks at some of the things that uh, need to be measured, should be measured, and how you measure those even among, for example, if we're interested in both patient and caregiver preferences, they may be uh, very different things and uh, difficult to uh, uh, make, make coherent side by side. And for those people who are more familiar with this literature, you'll know that there are, there are fundamental methodological questions about how you integrate economic evaluation of end-of-life care in other comparing it to, for example, child vaccinations or hip replacements is a, is a uh, technical, methodological minefield. So really, what is perhaps under, under discussing palliative care is the limitations of these evidence, this evidence base is fairly serious for policy influence. The fact that palliative care is not provided as widely as we'd like is not wholly 
down to the irrationality and stubbornness of policymakers because those, uh, those studies that have been done only look at certain phases, certain perspectives. Those inpatient stays, the end of life phase, are not all that uh, policymakers are really interested in. Even where we see small changes to formal care systems, for example, work that I've done in the United States has shown that it's not really reducing intensity of care that brings you the hospital cost savings, it's people leaving earlier, short, um, short hospital stay, expedited discharge, thanks to goal of care discussions and so on. Well, that's great, but it does really suggest even more than, uh, than previously we worried that if they're leaving hospital earlier, well, where are they going? Those costs potentially are being passed on to other parts of the system that simply aren't uh, being measured when we only look at the hospital silo. There's whole questions about, well, what even is palliative care um, is obviously not one thing, but many different combinations of things for many different populations. And so the catch-all sentence, the palliative care saves money, is, I think, overly simplistic and uh, self, uh, well informed policymakers understand that. Um, and there, were, there are other, I've not made this too research heavy a presentation, but there are very important issues here around selection bias and methodology. We have hardly any randomized control trials in this field and perhaps with good reason, but in observational studies, if you're looking who comparing people who get palliative care and who don't in hospital, people who get palliative care don't at the very end of life, they may be different groups in ways, those differences may be very hard to control for. So um, there are a number of concerns that would lead us to say that the widely touted sort of figure of substantial cost savings is almost certainly an overestimate because it looks at narrow episodes of care, the point where palliative care is able to make the most difference um, and possibly misleading altogether if those cost savings are passed on to other people. It may instead be that we're in the northeast quadrant and the palliative care is uh, better, but it is going to cost a little bit more. Um, and that isn't necessarily a problem, but it just means that we have to start thinking about palliative care and research approaches to it in a more sophisticated way. So these are the key points that I want to hammer home on the, on the economic evidence to date. There is this fairly consistent pattern of cost saving and actually this evidence has had, uh, particularly in the United States, has had a, a very large and demonstrable policy impact. But where services are underfunded or not universally provided, that is not always down to um, that bad decision making. It may also be due to legitimate concerns over the current scope of evidence. And, the narrow perspectives we have may not give us the full picture. Once we get that full picture, the argument may be stronger, and I think selection bias is always, always a concern in these populations. Um, all of us really would want the health system resources to be used in the best possible way, and that in particular this idea of costs being shifted from, for example, hospitals to uh, patients and families is not something that's going on, or at least not without us understanding about it and giving the appropriate support to patients and families uh, where that is necessary. So what can we say that this means for now and into the future? I think that it is, as I say now, a truism almost that palliative care is associated with lower costs, but it is important to be aware of the limitations to the budget, um, limitations rather to the evidence base, and aware that um, getting access to increased budgets is going to be a challenge because of the fiscal pressures that are there and the fact that um, the competition is always going to be fierce from other perhaps more better established and more simple healthcare interventions. So in order to improve the case strength and the case to policymakers, the scope of this kind of research, we need to continue to be more ambitious, expanding our scope. And that will mean that that message, that second bullet point will become more complicated. It will no longer be simply a case that palliative care is associated with lower costs. But that isn't necessarily something we need to be worried about or fear. It's really a, a sign of the growing maturity of the field of uh, increasing access to palliative care. Palliative care is in itself very complex. The patients are complex. It, it makes sense that the evidence is not completely straightforward. <laughs>
So those are the limitations that I would be particularly worried about, that the, uh, over, or the large majority of papers currently look at that end-of-life phase counting backwards, but that is no longer what we're all interested in, or not entirely what we're interested in anyway. That inpatient stays similarly and not really representative of the care trajectory as a whole, and informal carers in particular are not well served by the studies that have been done to date. It's also important to acknowledge, though, these limitations are not arbitrary. The policymakers are uh, not naive, but nor are researchers. Th these limitations exist because these are the studies we've been able to do in very complex uh, populations, very hard to recruit and retain people who are seriously ill, ditto with their families. And so the reason why you have the hospital studies, as I said, hospitals collect data. A lot of countback studies at end of life because particularly in the US, people, once people are enrolled in hospice, the data are there to be analysed. Um, alternatives to that, that that give us the kind of policy relevant evidence we want will be much more time and resource intensive. So it's certainly not uh, straightforward. And as I've also alluded to, palliative care itself is much harder to evaluate than, for example, a, a painkilling tablet or a hip replacement. Therefore, I suppose my key message is simply summarizing the, the points I've been trying to make from, from the start are that uh, as we move forward, it's important, I think, that we don't continue to do the same studies over and over again, even though those are the easiest ones to do because that's where the data are routinely collected. Instead, what decision makers really want is to understand the broadest possible perspective of the impact of these interventions and that given scarcity, given opportunity costs, that palliative care is the, uh, a, the best and su uh, most suitable place to allocate these scarce resources. That really means analyzing full episodes of illness prospectively from first time palliative care is involved until death. That might be, for example, according to um, American Society of Clinical Oncology from, from diagnosis now for cancer. Um, start to collect original data outside of hospital settings, outside of the US hospice program, and in particular understand what drives family costs and what supports they need. And we need to think more specifically, rather than palliative care is associated with lower cost, well, what do we mean by palliative care, all the different combinations of things that make up palliative care and all of the different combinations of people and clinical conditions that make up palliative care populations so that you're able to present evidence to policymakers that says, well, here is the specific uh, thing or combination of things that we should be giving to these people at this point. Um, I've left some references there, which if the presentation is going online, people can follow up on. And those are the contact details, I promise. Thank you. Goodness, I've learned some new words. Thank you, Peter. I um, wanted really to open up the floor for some comments or um, thoughts or questions for Peter and Fliss, and we've got the fixed mics, if you want to come up to any of the mics to um, ask a question or make a comment, or um, I think Kath's wandering around with the roving microphone as well, if you want to just stick up your hands. So, just while you're reflecting and musing, actually, Peter, I do have a question, which is what sort of, I'm very mindful in the hospice and palliative care community about how important it is for us to measure outcomes. So obviously there is the Oak Sweet um, outcome measures and the new ones that, that we're looking at introducing as well. But economic evaluation is always tricky. So what advice would you give to hospices if it's not necessarily a research project, if it's a simple we want to have an economic evaluation of an intervention or quality improvement, where should we be looking? Where is the intervention? Are you talking about in an inpatient hospice, for example? Well, it might or be. Um, um, it could be their interventions within the hospice, so within inpatient unit. It could be out in the community. It could be what, as thinking hospice as an approach in yeah. lots of different settings. So, but where do we start off with economic evaluations? Well. I suppose as, as I was uh, talking, speaking to in the presentation, when people when are in institutions, so for example, if you're in an inpatient hospice, then um, some level of cost data should be being 
collected routinely. So there is a way to um, start, it depends entirely on accounting systems and so on, but there is a basis there to start trying to put a figure on, well, what does it cost for the, um, uh, you know, the physical land, capital, equipment, drugs, supplies, all of those things that people are receiving, and also staffing rows as it's fair. It's a moderately capable economist would be able to take that kind of information and put, and put a cost on it relatively easily. The, where it gets complicated is when you move in one or two, is in two directions. The first of which is the, the informal thing. So if we are uh, worried, and we certainly should be worried, about the impact on families and informal caregivers, that data isn't collected anywhere at all. So if hospitals are interested in quality improvements, it's obviously that is a research project to get those data, but I suppose to be at least aware that that is a really important part of it and that can only be answered really by original data collection. But the other part of it is to think about who the comparison is going to be. As I said, there's a lot of hospital studies. There's very few hospice studies because a hospital brings in however many people and a proportion of those, a minority, you, you set eligibility criteria up, for example, in the US, it's standard to say if they have any one of these seven life-limiting conditions, they're a palliative care candidate, and then all of the people who got palliative care and all of the people who did not can be compared. But who are the people who are not in an inpatient hospice who, who you know, who should be, could be, who are a meaningful comparison group, who are the people who are not receiving your home care and how would you get to them? And I think that is, that's why there is very little economic evidence on hospice as an approach that it's hard to imagine how you do it with routine, routinely collected data. Bless you look like you want to add. I think, uh, it, to me, this is a really important question because... It's for us as a hospice and palliative sector, it's equally important to understand the people who don't get into the service as it is to understand the people who do get into the service, which is essentially what Peter's saying. Yeah. Um, so I think there are some things though we can take away from this. One is I think small scale evaluations in single sites are not always that helpful because the models of care are so variable. So I would urge you to become part of the Research Active Hospice Network and take part in a multi-centre uh, formal uh, evaluation of effectiveness which has some cost component. And those are increasingly growing because we're all recognising the importance of the economic evaluations. So I think there's something there about being part of a network and being research active. And this is the reason why we all need to be research active and to contribute to that evidence base, rather than trying to say, we're introducing a new service and our evaluation is just going to look at that new service. It's not going to give us any of the key answers. Thank okay. you. Um. The only thing I'd say on top of that, the, I mean, the other reason why comparison is so important that it's, for example, you show data on how people's outcomes change over the course of uh, a time, one before and after the public care thing becomes involved. But because of the um, costs are not yeah. the same every day, they will be they'll be highest. Uh, for example, when people first become engaged with the health service because they'll probably have had some kind of adverse event that brings them to the attention of the service and they'll be highest at the uh, end of life, most likely. And so um, doing a sort of before and after study yeah, with yeah. on individuals is, you know, it's very hard to conceive of how that is going to yeah. deliver yeah. really useful evidence. Okay. So, so I think it does give us useful evidence about the change in outcomes, but it doesn't give us the evidence around yeah. what the cost of that achieving that change of outcomes is. And that's another story altogether. Okay, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Thank you. Sarah McGee from Hospice Isle of Man. Um, thank you for two very stimulating presentations and um, 
so many thoughts in my mind, but going back to, if we look outside of hospice care, then we're looking at cost per quality really for all these policy decisions that you've talked about and just really carrying on from what you're discussing just now. We can look at the cost side in some ways, that's relatively simple. And the really tricky thing, as you said, is the outcome side. And we don't have a quality because if we try to measure qualities, obviously we're going to have relatively trivial numbers of qualities produced. And the benefit is all coming from, well, a lot of it is coming from the impact on carers and families. But Fliss, in your talk, you said you didn't like that. Well, you were crossing out that carer questionnaire. Um, you said that okay. possibly it needs to come out of the yeah. Oak suite of measures. So do we have anything to replace that? Or yeah. what would you recommend as the best way yeah. to capture those really important So the, there were two suggestions in the previous Oak suite. One was to have um, two items from the Zaret uh, carer burden measure. And the other has been uh, two items were adopted by the NHS England work, which are similar. I'm not saying it's not important. I think it's critically important. But what I am saying is that sites have struggled to use the measure of family outcomes because, for a start, quite a lot of people don't have family. So maybe 20, 15, 20% of people don't have anyone. And, you know, that has implications. The other thing is, is that often if they do have family, there are several people contributing to informal care. So who do you measure the carer outcomes in? Um, so we're not saying it's not important. It is important. What I'm saying is, is that the relatively simplistic way of trying to capture it is not really working. And I think um, I would really dearly like to work with uh, people like Gun Grande, who's sp speaking later um, from Manchester, who's kind of done a lot of work developing the CSNAT uh, in this area to assess carers' needs, but I think we need to do more to understand how we can capture the outcomes in relation to families. But I think it's a not yet sorted box rather than a not important box. And don't forget, there are two items in IPOS which reflect family issues. They're problematic because they're reported by the patient, but they give you some indication, albeit indirect, one is family anxiety, and the other is ability to share feelings with family as you wish. And those are quite helpful to flag up headline family issues that, that may or may not change. So I, I think we, we will solve this problem, but I think we probably need a bit more time to work on how to capture uh, family issues better. One of the other things is, is that uh, Zaret is a negative measure in the sense that it interprets everything as burden. And actually families don't see it in that way. They see that they have their own support needs, they have carer burden, and they have their own well-being. And there were three completely different things. And I think we probably need to start to unpick more of them. Thank you. And over at number two. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, Emily. I'm from St. Clair Hospice in Essex. Um, I've got one comment and one question. Um, my first comment is that as a palliative care physio, I'm beyond excited to hear that gas, uh, gas is going to be in the next suite. So you've made me very happy today. And then to hear you talking about mobility and weakness as being key things. You know, it's what we've known for a long time, but it's really good to hear people yep. talking about it. Um, my question is around the um, phase of illness yep. measure, which we're struggling a little bit with with some of our non-cancer patients. Yep. Um, we see about 50-50 cancer, non-cancer. So we've perceived that unstable is has active symptoms that are problematic, but some of our patients have those on a kind of quite long-term basis. They're kind of stably unstable. And we're struggling to say, are they stable? Are they unstable? They have things we need to be doing, but they're not going to change overnight. And then, of course, our duration of how long we're, they're unstable is long. So yep. we're struggling a little bit with that. So I don't know if you have any suggestions on how we kind of score them. So the, the, the definition is around how acute or uh, expected the problems are. So if they're, they're sudden, unexpected and acute, then they're unstable. And if they're more gradual and expected, then they're probably deteriorating. Um, and it is a hard call for people who've got a more long-term-ish problem. But the validation work does seem to imply that, in general, it does work okay in non-cancer. Yeah. 
Um, if you'd be willing to do more work on that with me, I'll be very happy to work with you. So give me a shout. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate it's not perfect, but it seems to be good enough. And it is far better as a way to understand the kind of duration of, of care episodes than to just look at episodes of care, which, which vary so widely from the people who just keep people on the books indefinitely to the people who have very discreet short-term interventions and discharge people. And I think that's why it gives so much added value. But I appreciate it's not easy to apply it. But I think it's the gradual and expected nature of their issues that should determine whether they're no longer unstable. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Andrew Thorns from um, Pilgrim's Hospice in uh, East Kent. Um, and thank you for the Sky subscription tips. I'm going to talk to the family about that, and it'll be in the <laughs> northeast quadrant. Um, first, we've been involved in the sea change study, and it's been fantastic. I mean, the stuff, the data you've given us back has had a huge impact on staff and trustees, I suspect on commissioners in due course. So it's been a really valuable thing. I can only just see the potential increasing. Yeah. But my question is more about hospitals. And Peter, I was going to talk to our hospital trust because we're des desperately understaffed when it comes to palliative care. I was going to give them this headline of, yeah, 20% cost savings if you invite to involve us early on. But now you're putting a shadow of doubt over that. Can I be quite confident in me going to talk to them about these sort of things or not? I, well, one of the critical things with the... Uh, hospital costs is the timing of the intervention so this is another thing that is only recently becoming clear but I would be fairly confident that if you provide palliative care to seriously ill people to appropriate candidates early in their hospital admission that that 15-20 percent is a fair ballpark figure my concern is that that is not re representative of the uh, treatment that people need across their disease trajectory and so we shouldn't be completely wowed by and focused on what is a very sort of impressive headline finding but only looks at one narrow essentially unrepresentative episode of care so I would strongly encourage you to do exactly that within the hospital uh, to increase palliative care activity there but I would also urge you to think about what is going to happen to those people once the palliative care team becomes involved they get a good expedited discharge and make sure they remain on a good pathway from that point. So Andrew we looked in, in Kings at um, <coughs> matched patients who did and didn't have palliative care so we matched them in terms of things like age and comorbidity and uh, the readmission criteria that the hospital applies to predict who's going to need readmission. Um, and that was really interesting because it showed very clearly that if you had early palliative care, the number of days of stay reduced and your cost reduced. So if you just want to make the argument to your hospital trust, you can make the argument quite convincingly. It's what happens, as I, I agree with Peter, it's what happens to those people afterwards. Because if they land in community services where there's no social care or just not enough social care or not enough informal care problems. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? So before we finish up, Peter and Fliss, could I ask you what's the just one thing that you would advise us? Only one thing and not just Sky subscriptions. Can I go off piste here? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> Get home and have a stiff whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, I think um, there is, in all of this, there's a message for you to take home to your service. And I, and I think it'll be different for each service. But just think it through and think what it is you want to take away and put into practice, uh, even if it's as simple as saying, I'm going to link up with other people to do my next economic evaluation. Okay. Peter? Yeah, I think it has to be to think, of, think about it carefully and uh, talk to an economist or two rather than it being straightforward to uh, race out and conduct with data that you have on an Excel spreadsheet somewhere, the, you know, the analysis that delivers the kind of evidence we want. It, um, it's going to be a slightly longer, more winding road than that, but one worth travelling, I think. Can I suggest something else? And the other thing is, sign up to Hospice IQ. 
I hope Sarah's <laughs> going to say that. <laughs> so um, I just wanted, really wanted to mention before we finish and thank our speakers is the um, Research and Outcomes Community of Practice, which includes a monthly newsletter and being able to access the Hospice IQ forum and dis uh, discussion forum and resource forum. Now, we've deliberately put research and outcomes together because I think that we felt that, that there's a very similar audience, but also we have very similar questions going on between us. Um, so we've started the monthly newsletter this week, and the aim of that newsletter is to provide regular things which are of use and of interest to you. So it may be something like a research conundrum or an outcome conundrum, so like the question about iPods or a question about, in the research world, about maybe indemnity, so that we can get a question that is common to all of us and that several people have answered to say this is how we've resolved it in our setting, for example. It could be about what is the upcoming research that we really want you to be able to look at. It could be about um, this is what, um, you know, the top key messages about um, economic evaluations or it could be about workshops and events coming up. So do sign up to it because what we want to do is to be useful and practical but also very much believing in that philosophy that a community of practice is about if we share knowledge together we're more likely to find more solutions together because none of us all know the answers. Um, so on that note, I'd like to um, thank um, Fliss and, um, and Peter in the traditional way, but also to say that my take-home message is about, from Fliss in particular, is about the importance of a rigorous and systematic collection examining a relevant person-centered data. Um, and Peter, from you, I've really taken away that the elephant in the room is not about buying peanuts. It's about economic evaluation and going, not being afraid to go and ask somebody else about what should I be thinking about. So thank you, and if we could thank them in the traditional way.